Hello, I'm Steve with Touch of the Master's Hand, Holy Spirit Ministries. I wanted to talk today about if my people, um, and I'm going to read the scripture and then just kind of break it down. Uh, it's just something the Lord's really been dealing with me about, and I'm just going to kind of dive into it. So here we go. Because I want to keep this as the backdrop as the theme. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. There's more to it. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. You know, it's hard for people in ministry to humble themselves. It's hard for Americans to humble themselves. We're a proud nation. You know, I kind of, I got to practice what I preach. Um, I'm going to kind of intertwine some stories in here and just, you know, some of the things I want to like, God, you know, you really want me to say that? You really want me to, say, you know, he's just dealing with me about some things and they're not going to come out in this message, but, you know, it's about sins of America and, you know, I don't want to be judgmental. I want the delivery to be right. I want people to take this to heart. But really, there's two other pieces I want to intertwine into this message, and then the humble piece. The message of the hour, Christ in you, the hope of glory, how God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit all live in you, and I've got 20 some scriptures to back that up. I'll send you the message if you want. You just have to email me. I'm not making that up. And then the other piece is in Matthew 10 about, and this goes along the lines of the humbleness, about a king that had the field. And if you read the story, and he promised to pay him all the same, and everybody agreed to the same. And at the end of the day, you know, some started early in the morning, some started late in the evening. At the end of the day, he called the last first, and they got paid. And then the people that, worked all day this goes along with the humble piece um, the people that worked all day expected more got got came time to get paid got paid and they copped an attitude figuring they should get more worth more said didn't I promise you to pay you all the same you know we're all on equal terms with Jesus whether you're homeless or a billionaire we, in America, put connotation on money as being, and it's going to take billions to, to fund this kingdom, you know, to, to do the things that God wants us to do. He may have you, you know, go to India and start a missionary over there. Well, you've got to have a plane ticket. It costs money to get over there, hotels, and, you know, so I'm not, you know, being narrow-minded, and, and money does not connotate evilness, nor does it connotate the blessing of God. You know, I mean, it's in the Bible. That's not a disparity that King David, they say in today's money was $250 billion or something like that, that he put into the tabernacle of David. A lot of money. He was a billionaire. But then look at the widow's might. She put in more than y'all did. And all these people tried to, you know. So, I mean, he can do things with money or without money. It's time for us as Americans to humble ourselves as ministers, as preachers. We have an ultimate responsibility. You know, it's like, I'll give you an example of no money, but then there's examples of that it's going to take a lot of money. It is going to take billionaires to sow into the kingdom. But, you know, God wants you to use your resources wisely. You may be a, a multi-billionaire. That doesn't mean you need to give billions. You need to give it responsibly with good stewardship. But give it to those that have a heart for Jesus. So I'll give you an example of no money. My wife and I, 38 years, you know, a lot of mistakes and a lot of awesomeness of God. Living for God and not living for God. Saved twice at 20 and, and 53 as a prodigal son. Angry at God during that time. A lot of mess. A lot of things not done right. But a lot of things that God did... Even in there, I'm not going to share all the stories. It's not. That's not about me. It's not about the stories right now. It's about the humbleness. Got to just be humble before God. But so we had a broken heart of ministry. I'll share that with you some other time. My wife and both of I have some broken hearted experiences to get us here. 
wasn't it was on our mind, but it wasn't, you know. A year and a half in prayer, my wife sat a lot, like hours and hours and hours. Well, one day during prayer service, this lady comes up to her and says, this was birthed in prayer. So, can we pray together? Well, long story short, the lady was the director of a homeless shelter. Introduced us to several people. It just kind of culminated into this chain of events. Take over Sunday night service was what the mandate was. So I go to the downtown Dallas homeless shelter, buzz the, buzz, the, buzz the gate, they open up the gate, I open up the church, somebody else built the church, nice pews, air conditioned, somebody else cleans it, stocked with toilet paper, just go there and minister the gospel. Whatever the Lord lays on my, my wife or our heart, there's a PA system there, zero, cost us a donut, nothing, not a building fund, not a, nothing. Open door. But, you know, like I said, I mean, you know, I know a man that went to Africa and didn't really have the money, but, you know, he needed $8,000 to help the people build a well and came back with by faith and got open the door and somebody donated him 10 grand. Built the well. So, you know, that cost 10 grand. You know, God can work with money or without money. But we put significance and importance on the money aspect of it, and I got a bigger church, and 2,000 people came, and, you know, I'm going to build a bigger band and promote the band and promote, you know, my YouTube presence and all the stuff, you know, cameras and blah, 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 and da, da, da. Well, what's God saying, you know? Is that really a move of God? It, 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 it can become about man. You know, what's God telling you to do? It's hard to be a minister because God downloads things into us and it's just awesome. And we want to kind of puff ourselves up, put ourselves in a place above. You know, it's like some, you know, it's like having a huge ministry and then you slap your name on top of it, you know, and then it kind of starts to become about you. Well, you know, you, you may have been in the ministry for 50 years and doing some awesome things for God, but you know what? The prayer of the homeless person is just as important. You might not think so. We kind of just connotate it as, you know, we're somebody. We're really not. We're all children of, the, we're all sons of God. It even says so. You know, that's what I'm telling you about in Matthew. We have to humble ourselves as a nation, as a people. And at the same time, God told me, he said, walk with one as authority and authority. Look at Jesus' example. There at the beginning. Creation. Foundation of the world. When God created the world, and the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. But when it came time to go to the cross, and the, the death and the cross, the cross is not where the power is. It's the obedience of the cross. You know, there was a capital punishment in the form of, you know, thousands of people died that way. Horrible. And I'm not downplaying that death of Christ like that. That's not what I'm saying. But it's that he took on the sins of the world. And he was obedient in death. That he carried and bore all this crap for us. He was the ultimate power, and yet he humbled himself. Power in check hard to do you know I mean because we you know just I mean I battle it you know and I'm trying not to so like I said I got to practice what I preach so it's kind of like you have a big ministry Billy Graham or anybody you know he's gone and I'm not you know not miss don't want to misuse his name um, but it's kind of like you got a, if you got a family and you got a 16 year old and a 4 year old at the house, sons, okay, your kids. Well, you're at work, your wife's at work, so what do you do? You call home, hey, you know, will you make dinner for your little brother Johnny? Blah, blah, blah. It's in the micro, it's in the oven, put it in the microwave. You know, you might give them instructions. You know, you kind of count on them. You might tell them to go to the store. Um, you know, you expect something out of them to take care of it. You don't call the 4 year old. But when it comes time for that 16-year-old to get a car, you buy him a car. Try to buy him a decent car. When it comes time to go to college, you, you, you know, you want to set up a college fund for him, you know, to get married and just 
get a start in life. You want to do things for them. Well, when the four-year-old comes along to that age, you do the same thing. You want to do the exact same thing for your kids, all your kids, all your children. A good parent does. Same. Equal. Love them the same. So it's a maturity level. That's all it is. It's not a giftings and callings level or any of that other stuff, you know. Um, my wife and I were cleaning the church one night, and it was 11 o'clock at night. Church was over, ministers were gone, evangelists were gone, poor people were gone, you, you know. But there was pockets of people praying, and, and they were all outside because security kicks them outside at a certain time. And they were all outside the parking lot. And there was a group of four people, three or four people, praying for this guy that had some really serious knee problems for over a year. He had been involved in a very serious car wreck. I just overheard it because I was out there cleaning the front, front area. Well, that, he didn't care who God used. I don't know those people. I see them. Maybe, maybe not. I just, you know, we're a fairly large church. God does. A lot of stuff's going to happen in the weeds and off in the different, what's God telling you to do? Who's your source? That's kind of the other part of my message. Who's your source? You know, one time I was in the midst of a trial and it involved my son and I just, you know, my wife's, Telling me I need to say something to him and blah 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 and this is dead and da 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 and like didn't really feel that and I was like but I needed to and I was like kind of mixed up and so she went off and did her thing and I was a mess and it needed to be straightened up but I was like so I started praying mad at the devil that he even got involved in this and stirred up some stuff strife and just stuff it was a it was a big mess. So, stomping back and forth, didn't know what to do, kind of did, kind of didn't, kind of in prayer and not, not out of prayer, not really in the spirit like I needed to be, but trying to get there, because as a dad, it was just kind of stirring me up, different things. Finally, I start getting a breakthrough, and finally, I surrender, threw up my hands, Jesus, what would you do? Because I didn't know. I didn't have an answer. I didn't have a clue. I need some help. It's that simple. We can go to the source. We can go to God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. If Jesus lives in us, we can go to him whenever we want. And it's all it is about you guys. It is about you. And it's not about reaching millions of souls or not. It's about your individual walk with Jesus. So that was my individual walk and my time that I needed God. And I went to him. And a year or so before, during the midst of another trial, he told me, he said, I want you to always go to my word. So Jesus, what would you do? Was was my prayer. And he, he took me to his word. He said, James 3.17. My memory is not the greatest. And I'm not like a lot of preachers. And I can't quote scriptures like I need to or even remember them. Some of them, it's 317, I didn't, even, I didn't have a clue. Could have been, you know, something about the lineage of David for all I know. And I'm not trying to twist up the scripture. So I, it's like, okay, God, grab my Bible. The wisdom from above. For it's peaceable, gentle, long-suffering. When you read on farther down, it says, such as once were you, sinners, and, you know, pretty much full of hell and God had grace on us so we need to have grace on others so that was the message grace and love and show my son God's love portray God's love didn't want to as his dad I really needed to say something straighten him out give him a piece of my mind shake him up it was a mess I can air my dirty laundry it was just a stumbling block on his part but I showed him love. I did what God told me to do. Talked to him and over a period of time ministered to him. And It's been two years now and that situation is completely gone and done. And But it was within a couple of weeks it was gone and dissolved and changed and turned around. Because I listened to God. So what's God telling you to do? You know, where, where are you at? You know? Like I said, we can get stuck on ourselves, you know, and I'm not 
how can people have in a great band? You know, there was a, I saw a church that had this slogan, God is near. That's, you know, I'm sorry, but that's, you know, getting a little bit religious. I want a God that's near. He lives in me. I can back it up with what I'm saying. It's in the Bible. Tell, tell me to send you the message on God's image of you. The, the Lord inspired me to write a book. It's in the book. I can give you 20 scriptures that talk about God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit all living in you. Read St. Luke 17 and 20, 21. One, one of my awesome landmark scriptures that God gave me. So, you know, it's like my, I was drinking my coffee one morning. It's like my coffee cup's sitting there. It's like, well, it's near to me. It's sitting next to me. No, I want it in me. Probably not a good analogy because coffee's not good for you, but I wanted the caffeine. I wanted the coffee in me. I want to, you know, drink my three cups. I want to taste it and, and down it and drink it. And there I am drinking this, you know. So, you know, who's your source? Go to the Bible, Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit. When you accept Jesus in your heart, everything changes and then he wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And, he, you know, he created us to be his dwelling place. We're the Ark of the Covenant. <coughs> trying to be religious, sir. We carry ultimate authority. <coughs> Yet we have to be humble. You know? A situation happened recently with somebody I love. And they saw something that wasn't even true. The situation that wasn't even true. And it really hurt. And I took offense to it. They didn't because they kind of went on and what they said just, you know, I could tell it didn't even, they didn't even think there was any offense there. But a choice. Get offended at them. Turn it over to God. Talk to God. Maybe it's time for me to die out in that situation. Maybe I'm supposed to talk to him and straighten it out. I don't know yet. You know, I'm still praying about it. First day, you know, I kind of got a little bit, I was a little bit angry and upset and mad and, you know, me. Did take offense to it because it wasn't true. So, time to turn it over to God, and I was okay with that. But then the second day, I was like still a little bit mad. I was like, okay, God, I just really need to just, I don't need to pick up this as an offense. I need to turn it over to you. So, open their eyes, let them see, you know, was my prayer. Well, that's still taking offense, you know. So now I got to just pray, okay, God, let them see through the blood. Let them see how you see it. But, you know, let God handle it. Turn it over to Jesus, you know, and that's not trying to ignore the situation. I, you know, it's going to probably come a time where I'm going to have to, you know, talk to him about it. I'm just praying about it, you know. So, you know, I've humble myself, not take offense to it, what people say or think or don't do or do. I just have to do what God tells me to do. What's God telling you to do? You know? This world, this, unfortunately, America has a hard time humbling itself. We're a proud nation. We're a religious nation. And there's a lot, you know, a lot of churches, but they're full of dead men's bones. The Spirit's not moving. I'm sorry, you know. You have a 3,000-member congregation, but does that mean that's a move of God? Just because you got a $100 million building or whatever? Not necessarily. But not necessarily not either. Could be, you know. I'm not, you know, we all need pastors, you know, because God gives them directional and correctional messages. We have to have authority. We have to live underneath there. We have to have, you know, a place to praise and worship and pray, you know, and so, tongues are important. You know, there was a time in my life in 1994, dark, dark place in my life, and this really popular Christian singer, and he was on the radio all the time because the song was so popular, kept coming on, and it helped carry me through a really dark time in my life. So I get it. I understand that. But we can put significance and importance on things that aren't important to the kingdom of God. On our church, on our building programs, on how many people come, on what we do on YouTube can become a God. We can have all these false idols. You know, so... So you have a ministry that reaches 100,000 people. Great, awesome, you're a vessel. But you're no greater than the vessel that's 
poor and homeless on the street, God's going to hear his prayer, just his or her, her prayer, just as much as yours. I'm sorry to tell you that. It's true. It's in the Bible. I can back it up. I'm not making this up just to make this up. I have to live by that. It's hard. The Lord inspired me to write a book, and it's awesome, and it's about visions, and it's a gifting that he's given me. And I've had, I've had hundreds of them like water, and I didn't want to do it. You know? Send it away for a free copy. Email me at steveyoungstrom at yahoo.com, and I'll send you a free copy of it. But, you know, I, he told me to leave out the interpretations of them. I wanted to, but he said he didn't want man's interpretation. Okay, God, you know, what's God telling you to do? What direction is he having you go? I know this is kind of long, so I'm going to tell this last brief thing, and then um, hopefully you've listened to this far along. But, you know, what's God telling you to do? You know, he told me a while back that he was going to tell me and my wife to get in her car and go, or on a plane and go. It's calling us into the ministry full-time right now, not there, and it's just kind of just waiting on things to transpire. Um, trust in God, because he showed me some things, and some of them he's already started to work out. So, he told me to go to Italy, Texas. I'm like, oh, I don't know where that is. That's 60 miles south of Dallas, because I passed it when I used to go visit my mom and dad in Austin. Look it up. 300 people. Period of a couple months went by and kept dealing with me about it. I don't really want to go. Why? And tell my wife and all these reasons came up why we couldn't go and grandkids and just different things and stuff in life. Well, this lady opened a restaurant down there, and if we would have went when he first told me to start started dealing with me she hadn't opened it yet so finally we go after about three months she just opened the restaurant a week before so we go to go down there and we get down there my wife's like well god told us to come you know he better show up what do we you know we drove you know why are we down here I well i feel like we're supposed to go eat we'll go eat okay so little town two restaurants 12 buildings and eight of them are vacant you know or whatever you know it's just a really podunk little town get there eat start eating i'm like we're supposed to pray for feel like we're supposed to pray for the owner well like long story short we did get to minister and pray for her for a long time almost a couple hours god opened up some doors then you know so i was like okay god i see what you're trying to deal with this and then the next one was was little elm and tells me to you know Pray for the postal clerk and then go to the library and find the clerk and ask him for a book on witchcraft. I'm like, oh, wait a minute, God, that's not you. You know, what are you talking about? That's crazy. Well, long story short, prayed for the postal clerk when we got there. She really needed ministering because she was in the midst of a really big, fiery trial. Long story. But we did what God said. When we get to the library, the lady was a born again Christian. Her story was that, and she'd been studying her genealogy, and it was full of, you know, granddad's witch, witch warlocks and witches, and her grandmother, and just all this mess. And she wanted to take a stand against that demonic genealogy and, you know, spiritual wickedness of her past. My wife got a chance to minister and pour into her and prophesy, and we watched God move. Well, that door never would have opened. Well, now he's dealing with this. Told me, um, I'll make this last within one more minute. Told me to go to Canyon Creek, Illinois. I'm like, Canyon Creek, Illinois? I don't want, you know, we work, and it's kind of hard to take off work. I need to replace this, and it's, you know, going to cost thousand, two thousand dollars $2,000 to do, probably 1000 to get there, plus we're going to pay somebody. Yet. We don't have nobody to back us up. Don't want to do it. Long story short, we're going over the 4th of July weekend. Our work's closing for the whole week, so we don't have to pay anybody. It just kind of culminated into that, so we're going. Well, when I looked up Canyon Creek, I'll, I'll end with this. When I looked up Canyon Creek, nothing came up. Canyon Creek, there's not even a city named Canyon Creek, Illinois. So cities in the U.S. named Canyon Creek, there's one in Utah. I just looked it up 18 different ways, spent 20 minutes, nothing. All of a sudden, a Zillow ad pops up. Canyon Creek, the street, there's a house for sale in Canyon Creek, Illinois. 
but it's in a town called Normal, Illinois. And the Lord said, that's it. He said, I want you to take three days to drive there, spend the day there, which is going to be the 4th of July, and three days to drive back. Drive. Okay, get in the car and go. Okay, so, okay. So, we're going. It took a while to get there, but we're going. And everything just transpired, and we're able to go. I don't know what God's going to do. But he's got us on a mission and a reason and a purpose. My wife's like, can't he, you know, do something local? Well, he does. We minister at the Austin Street Shelter in downtown Dallas. We minister to people at our church. We minister to people that live in our neighborhood. It's just, or at the Walmart or wherever, you know. But And people, he sent people to our house out of the blue. But, you know, so what's God telling you to do? Do what God's telling you to do. He's calling his people or his vessels. Look up, you know, look, please watch some of my other videos. This one's kind of long and I apologize for it. But it's time for my people, if we humble ourselves and pray and turn from our wicked ways and turn from our sin and turn back to God and quit letting all these idols influence us. What's God telling you to do? But anyhow, thank you for watching and I'm going to end it with this and I know it's kind of long and I... Hopefully people will still watch it. But anyhow, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Um, you can email me at steveyoungstrom at yahoo.com. You can like, dislike, comment, uh, just whatever. Love you guys. See you soon.